Right. Hello, everyone. Um, so, yep, yeah, I'm Jim. I'm a mobile developer working for a company called Erode, based out in New Zealand. Yep, yeah, we have mobile developers out in Middle Earth. Um, so, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about how we can click on the real world using a couple of technologies, uh, iBeacon and Eddystone. Uh, I'm going to talk about what an iBeacon is, what an Eddystone is, uh, what contextual aware apps are, how we can get our devices to interact with the real world uh, seamlessly. I'm going to do a bit of hands-on coding. I'm going to show you how to write your first iBeacon app. Uh, not going to show you how to write an Eddystone app, because there's just, unfortunately, not enough time. But we are going to do a little iBeacon app. But most importantly, I want to talk to you about coffee. Yay. Now, co buying coffee is not as easy as it could be. You think it would be. So every day, millions of people do the same thing to buy coffee. We go to the same coffee shop at about the same kind of time every day. We queue up in the same queue. We get to the same cashier. We order the same coffee. We pay the same amount, usually to the same cashier, get our loyalty card stamped, all the same. We give them the same name. Uh, we then go and wait in the same area. And then the barista, usually the same person, makes us that self-same coffee, calls out our name, and then we go and get the coffee. Or if there's multiple people with the same name in a busy time, lots of people fight over the coffee. So that's not easy. That's not seamless. That's not what we get, we're expecting from the modern world. So if you think, I can get a car to pick me up, take me anywhere I want to go, just by touching two or three taps on an app. I don't have to speak to anybody. I don't have to interact with anybody. There's no cash transaction. It just works. Why can't coffee, buying coffee, why can't it be exactly the same? So just taking a, a sort of step back from that, we interact with our devices all the time. But we interact with a virtual representation of the world on our device. So our devices become an, an extension of ourselves. Uh, cybernetic anthropologists are looking at how we have devices as memory stores, as extensions of our ability to communicate, uh, how we feel uncomfortable if we're detached from our device. So it's become an extension of our physical selves. But to interact with the physical world, we can't do it directly. We do it with a virtual representation. If we want to try and improve our coffee buying experience, we load up an app on our phone, and we tap a button to say, I want to buy some coffee. When the coffee's been made, we can tap on the app to say, I'm sitting over here, bring me my coffee. So although we can get real world things to happen, they happen by interacting with that virtual representation of the world. But it doesn't have to be like that. Can we click on the real world? And what I mean by that is, when I walk into a coffee shop, if they have an app, can the act of walking in to the coffee shop be the same as searching for their app on the app store? And I just can see a link to it straight away and install it if I want to. And then once I've got that app, if I walk into that coffee shop, can that act of walking in be the same as clicking on a buy button? So I don't get my phone out of my pocket. I don't load an app. I just walk in, and, uh, and somebody knows to make me a coffee. And then once my coffee's been ordered, say I sit down at table number 14, or I stand in the corner by the newspapers, can that act of putting myself in a certain position in that coffee shop be the equivalent of entering my table number on the app so they know where to bring my coffee to me? So can these things just happen by my physical actions without using that virtual representation uh, on my phone? And the answer is yes, using the power of Bluetooth beacons. So what are Bluetooth beacons? Here's one. This is a little one made by a company called Estimo. Uh, they make awesome beacons. Highly recommend their stuff. I'm not affiliated with them. I just, I just love their gear. Uh, now what these Bluetooth beacons are is they are a beacon that transmits a signal via Bluetooth obviously. So what do we mean by a beacon? A beacon is something that has a one-way transmission of information, and based on that information, you can understand something about your environment. The classic example is a lighthouse. So in times of uh, sailors, you're on a boat, you're sailing in the darkness, and you see this spinning <coughs> beam of light in the distance. It's one-way communication. The lighthouse is transmitting this beam of light out to you. It doesn't know who you are. It doesn't care if you're there. It just transmits this beam of light. And you, as a sailor, can go, that means rocks. I understand something about my environment, something about my context, because of this one-way signal being sent to me. And we do the same thing with Bluetooth. So these little beacons use a Bluetooth advertising packet 
containing some form of identifier. And our apps can use that identifier to understand their environment, understand rare, where they are in the real world, and interact with them. Now, this is not the Bluetooth you've been swearing at. This is not the Bluetooth you have in your car, where you're trying to get your phone to talk to your radio, and you enter your PIN numbers, and the blimmin' thing just doesn't work. It's not like that. This is not paired. This is just an advertising packet. It's a packet of data that it sends out. Any Bluetooth device can detect this seamlessly and respond based off that identifier. So this seems quite cool, but we have to have standards. You've always got to have standards. And there are two beacon standards, and we're going to look at these in a bit more detail in a minute. Uh, the first of them is called iBeacon. No prizes for guessing which manufacturer came up with iBeacon. Um, so yeah, a few years ago, Apple decided they wanted to do this. And their idea with these beacons was we can use the signal that we get to not only um, wake our app up when we receive this signal and respond to that, but also to get an idea of how far away these beacons are so we can get an idea of our location in terms of indoor space. So not only can I detect a signal from this beacon, but I know how far away the beacon is so I know where I am. Uh, and then last June, Google jumped on the bandwagon as well. Uh, they've come up with this project called the Physical Web where they want the whole world to be an internet. They want to have URLs and packets of data assigned to physical real-world objects. Uh, and they've done that using a type of beacon called Eddystone, which is their open source format. Uh, so that's useful for attaching URLs or uh, packets of data. So we're going to look at those two in a bit more detail and see how they can help us with our coffee buying process. So let's start by talking about iBeacons on iOS, because this was the granddaddy uh, of beacon technologies. The way iBeacon works is in my advertising packet, I send out four pieces of data. Three of those are, are an identifier. There's a 128-bit UUID, a major version, and a minor version. Uh, and the fourth is a transmission power. Now, the idea with these IDs is when you write an app that can interact with beacons, you say, I am interested in the beacons with this ID and then optionally this major and minor version. And then when you detect those beacons, your app can respond to those. And we'll do a live demo of that in a second. Uh, now, the transmission power that it sends as well that is the cool thing. So each beacon is certified by the manufacturer as transmitting its signal at a certain power. So this beacon, I think, is transmitting at 48 decibels. When iOS detects the beacon, it measures how strong the signal is that it receives. So this sends out 48 decibels. My phone picks up 20 decibels. And based off that loss of signal, it makes a guess as to how far away that beacon is. And that is very cool. That allows us to work out approximate guesses at, at distance, which means, for example, if I had four beacons, one on each wall of this room, based off the signal strength from each beacon, I could make a guess as to where exactly in this room I was sitting. It's just a guess. Bluetooth is not particularly good at going through walls, people, um, glass, what have you. But you can make a rough guess of where things are. And that helps us if you want to improve the way we do coffee. Uh, now, iBeacon and iOS built into the operating system. It's all part of core location. You've got location permissions, the same as uh, any GPS code that you write. You can get icons on your lock screen automatically because it's built into the OS. Uh, it's really, really cool. But it's not particularly secure. So the signal comes out. It's on the Bluetooth advertising packet. Anybody who can pick up Bluetooth, any device that can pick up Bluetooth, can pick up your signal. So it's not a particularly secure mechanism. Um, so that's something you have to think of when you, use, uh, when you use it. Now, all that is probably a bit, whoa, a lot of information. So let's just write an app. That's probably the best way we can do this. And I'm hoping the uh, demo gods are on my side when I do this. So I'm going to start with a simple, empty iOS app. I've got a little bit of code in here that I've pre-written to do local notifications. And I've defined an ID there just because I can't be bothered to type that out. Otherwise, this is a clean app. Let's build an iBeacon app here. So iBeacons are built into core location. So we don't have to worry about any fancy SDKs. There's no CocoaPods, NewJays, or anything like that we have to install. We're in core location. So we're down at the OS level. So let's start by creating a location manager. And IntelliSense is not working. You can see I'm using the old Xamarin Studio, not the new shiny black one. OK, so I've got a location manager. 
And if you've done any GPS work with, um, with iOS, you've probably seen these before for geofencing. And let's just create my location manager. Okay, done. Right, now location is something that requires permission. Uh, Apple does not like your apps knowing too much information about you without your consent. They don't like apps knowing where you are in the, in the world, monitoring your location, foreground, background, without your permission. So we need to get that permission. So let's just do that now. Uh, we can request authorization from the user. Two types of authorization with location, when in use um, or always. When in use means track my location just when the app is in the foreground. Always means track it all the time, foreground, background, whatever. We're going to use always so we get track in the background. Um, because it allows us to show off some very cool features. Now, a little quirk with location. When the permissions dialog pops up to say, can this app use uh, your location, it gives you a reason why. So this is your chance as a developer to say to your user, I'm tracking your location to help you get coffee, not just to be creepy or, uh, or what have you. Uh, and that has to be done using an entry in your info plist, obviously. Uh, not the most logical place. Uh, and there's two things I can set. Location always uses description, and location when in use uses description. Uh, their actual underlying info plist names are really bizarre, so um, I'm quite happy that they're now in the plist editor. And then, uh, if it's going to work for me, if I'm, it's going to let me click. For some reason, Xamarin Studio is not letting me click. OK, so I'm going to say we want to use this always to get coffee at Evolve. OK, so I've just set that in there. Right, so we request authorization. We've got our message to our user. Uh, we then need to respond to the authorization change. So there's an authorization change event that gets fired, and we will just um, respond to that. So whatever happens with, um, with whatever setting you choose, whenever your app starts up, your authorization status is always unknown. You always have to call request authorization. If you've, if you've got permission in the past, this just passes straight away. If you haven't got permission in the past, you get to see the little dialog. So I'll just very quickly check if my status um, does not equal authorization status. Always return, bit of a sanity check. So now I've got my location manager and I'm authorized. Let's do some stuff with beacons. Now, when you interact with beacons, there's two ways you can interact with a beacon. You can monitor and you can range. Now, when you monitor, that is your way of saying to the operating system, I am interested in any beacon that matches a set of criteria. And once you've told the operating system this, whenever your, the OS detects the presence of the beacons that match that criteria, or detects the absence of them, if, you've, if it's already detected the presence, the OS will wake your app up. And this is one of the very, very cool things with iBeacon. So you register with the OS, I'm interested, your app gets woken up. So if you've ever done geofence code, it's very similar. When you walk into a geofence, your app wakes up. Same kind of thing. When I detect beacons, my app wakes up. So you notice I'm writing this in my app delegate, because my app, if I detect a beacon, my app wakes up, it runs my app delegate code, I can respond. So let's monitor for beacons. And when I monitor, there's a start monitoring method. And this takes a region. Now, if you've done geofence work before, you've probably seen this. And you're probably used to uh, GPS regions, latitude, longitude, radius. Beacons are kind of similar. Uh, with a beacon, you have a region that you define based off the ID. So remember I said iBeacon has 128-bit UID, major, minor. A region is defined as all the beacons that conform to at least the ID, and then optionally the major and minor version. So what I'm going to do here is create a region, which is a new CL beacon region. And here you go in the, in the IntelliSense. I can define it based off a proximity ID, ID and major, ID and major and minor. For now, I'm just going to use proximity ID just for purposes of the demo. And then I have to name my region. Uh, evolve region. 
Okay. And then I can call start monitoring on my region. And that's kind of basically it. That's my app saying to the OS, wake me up. That bit's kind of done. Now, with these regions, you have a three-part ID, and that's to allow you to define how you want to interact with different beacons. So a good example for this would be, if I had a chain of coffee shops, I'd want to roll out beacons to all my coffee shops. Every beacon would have the same 128-bit uh, UUID. So in my app, I know I detect that ID, my app wakes up. I'd then have a different major for each branch, so that when I'm detecting beacons, I can tell from the major version number which branch of my coffee shop I'm in. I'd then use the minor for the different beacons in the coffee shop. And I'd use that so I can measure the distance to each beacon to work out my internal location. But really, there's a whole flexibility around these IDs. Um, the only quirk is you can only register 20 regions in your app. So you don't want to have, uh, if you've got 100 beacons, you don't want to have one region per beacon. It won't work. But you can have a, you kind of have a bit of a choice as to how you want to register these regions. It's kind of very open as to what you want to do. OK, so I've got my region. I've started monitoring it. And then I just need to wire up a couple of events for when we enter and leave the region. So there's region entered. Uh, and I'll just whatever. And I've got some note code already written to send enter and exit notifications. These just send local notifications just to illustrate what we're doing here. OK. So what have I done here? I've got my location manager. I've requested authorization. Um, when I get my authorization, I create a region. And then I say, start monitoring region. And that's basically all we need to do to wake my app up and, do, and respond to it. But let's do a little bit more. Let's have a bit more fun here. Um, I've got a view. We've got a view controller for it here. And this view's just got a text box on it. And let's change the color of my view depending on my location relative to my beacons. Let, let's show a bit of information. So a little bit of code pre-written. Only thing to do with beacons is I can't be bothered to retype out the region ID um, or type out the location manager. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to my location, my location manager. And I'm going to uh, start ranging. Now, ranging uh, is a beacon-specific thing. This is not like monitoring, which is for all GPS. Ranging is a foreground action. Monitoring is operating system, wake me up when you detect a beacon. Ranging is, now I'm awake, I want a stream of data about all the beacons that I can detect. So when you range, every second, the OS will send you a list of all the beacons it can detect and information about those beacons, such as the ID. So let's handle the event to get these beacons. So location manager did range beacons. Just wire up a little lambda to this. And let's do something here. So let's just get the first beacon. Um, oh, sorry. It would help if I define a region. Um, so var region, let me see our beacon region. Uh, I've got my region ID and whatever. And that's the region I passed to start ranging beacons. OK, so I've got my region. I'm ranging it. Uh, and then every, time, every second, my did range, beacon, uh, did range beacons event will get fired. Now, once I start ranging, this event gets fired every second regardless of whether there's any beacons there or not. So we have to handle the case that there could be there's no beacons. So I'm just going to pull the first beacon out of my event args. So you see in my event args, I've got beacons and region. I can, if I have multiple regions, I can use this region property to know whether I'm raging beacons from whichever of my multiple regions. But right now, I'll just get the beacons, and I'll just get the, the first one. Uh, if we don't have one, I'm just going to clear, uh, clear my view, background color equals UI color dot white. Ooh, help if I could type. Uh, and I've got a label on screen. Uh, this is label text equals nothing. OK. Now, if I do have a beacon, let's do something cool with it. Let's, display, let's set the background color based off the distance to my beacon. This is cool. So I've got a method already defined, color from distance. And here I need to tell this method how far away my beacon is. And we have that. So against my beacon, I've got a number of properties, and the coolest of which is called accuracy. 
It's a really, really rubbishy name for what it is. So based on the transmission power that's manufacturer certified against the device, and based off a thing called the RSSI, the Relative Signal Strength Indicator, which is a measure of how much power my device has received, the OS makes a best guess in meters of the distance to my beacon in clear air. They call it accuracy rather than distance because it's a guess. Um, they do have another property called proximity, which is more of a, an E number three state thing of near, intermediate distance, and far, which is a, a bit more reliable in terms of rough measurement. But this is just a guess in clear air how many meters away is my beacon. OK, so I'm just going to use that to set the color of my screen. And then I'm actually going to dump that message, uh, dump that distance out onto screen uh, just because I can. Distance to coffee, and then meters. Okay, and then just the last little quirk I need to think about here: uh, this accuracy, as I said, is a guess. If the signal is a bit unreliable, then you get an accuracy of minus one. So a little quirk to be aware of: minus one means not sure. There could have been some interference. So I'm just going to filter those out. Uh, else if uh, first dot accuracy is greater than equal to zero. OK, so what have we done here? Um, we've said, I want to range these beacons, send me a list of all the beacons, and I will update my UI based off the estimated distance. So I'm just building that. And I'm going to run this. And hopefully, if the demo gods are on my side, we should see some beacons in action. just flipped my device. Now, one thing to note, if you're ever working with iBeacons on iOS, simulator doesn't work. You need Bluetooth. You have to use a physical device. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. Right, first thing we notice, allow my app to access your location when you're not using the app. And there's my little message at the bottom, get coffee evolve. So this is how we can use the info P list to explain to our users why we want to use their location. We're not just being creepy. So let's allow that. And then we want notifications just because I added those to shelf. OK, so here we go. I've got a beacon. It's here. My phone is here. And it reckons it's about 0.2 meters away. So straight away, I've got some context. I've got an, in an indoor location. I'm going to move my beacon rather than move my phone because it's all plugged in. I'm going to move the beacon instead. Let's come over here. And we'll notice that it's going up. A little bit slow, but every second it ticks through. And there you go, there's my distance. So I've got my indoor location. It could be this is fixed and my phone is moving. I've got that location. Uh, now that's a guess through clear air. If I put it behind me, um, it will probably start to shoot up. There you go. So it thinks I'm 4.8, 5.2 meters away. I'm not, because there's something in the way. So be aware, this is a guess. Um, but yeah. There we go. So, so now our app has an awareness of my indoor location. It's very cool. It's very powerful what you can do with that. OK. So now let's think about waking my app up, the other cool thing. And then we can start putting this into context of how we can buy coffee. I'm going to terminate my app. That's it. It's dead. It's killed. Um, now, assume the demo gods are on my side, which Sometimes the very first time you monitor an eye beacon, it can be a little bit flaky. But assume the demo gods are on my side. When I turn my beacon on, it's currently switched off. These estimate beacons, are, uh, you can set it so they're off when they're upside down. When I switch it on, oh, demo gods are not on my side. Sometimes this happens the very first time that you, um, that you monitor a beacon. It won't always pick up the signal. But what will happen now, I've now turned it off again. So in Theory, what we should see in a few seconds is it detects the loss of that beacon signal. It detects that it's no longer in that region. It takes about 30 seconds for this to happen because the OS has to have a bit of time to, um, to really make sure that you're not there. It's not just a signal that's been lost, it's that you're not there. So in theory, any minute now, assume the demigods are on my side, we should get a notification to say uh, that we've left that region. And, oh. Demogods are not, are not loving me very much today. 
Um, let me just try turning it on and see what happens. Oh. Okay. Let me just double check my code. Monitoring, I'm there, got a beacon. I enter. Okay. That is quite annoying. This should work. It's worked every time when I've practiced this one. Um, okay, trust me. Trust me, it works. <laughs> Sorry? 10 points, the genius over in the corner there. I put it on to get rid of all the Twitter notifications. Um, yeah, okay, so assuming I not had my phone on Do Not Disturb, thank you very much, a free beacon coming your way later, um, then we would get a notification. So, as I said, 30 seconds after you turn the beacon off or you get out of range of beacons, then your app should get woken up. Um, so, there we go. Yay! Okay, um, so I'll just turn it on now and... Hey, there we go. So it's quite a lot of power what we're doing here. We're saying it doesn't matter if your app's terminated, these beacons can wake you up. So thinking back to buying coffee, I want this seamless coffee buying experience. So I want to install an app, which I know about from, from however I know about the app. I want to say, every time I go into this coffee shop, make me a flat white, and then, and then bring it to me. So using this beacon, I can do that. So I have my phone in my pocket, I walk into the coffee shop, it detects the beacon signal inside the coffee shop, and as we've seen with Bluetooth, it doesn't really go through things very well, so we don't have to worry too much about the signal leaking out into the street. GPS wouldn't work so well, because GPS, you'd order a coffee every time you walk past the coffee shop, uh, rather than walk into it. With these beacons, with their limited range, their limited power, when I walk in, it can order my coffee. My app wakes up, it's got however long in the background iOS allows this week to send a message to uh, the servers for the coffee shop to say, make Jim's coffee. And they can go away and make their coffee. And then once my coffee's made, uh, because they can work out my location by arranging the beacons, they just need something to kick my app awake so it can range the beacons, find out where I am, and they can bring the coffee straight to me. Totally seamless. I walk into the coffee shop, I can just lean on the counter, I can flick through Twitter, and someone comes and brings me my coffee. So suddenly, iBeacons have completely changed how I can buy coffee. So that's iBeacons. Um, they're very, very cool. I love them, as you can probably tell. So let's just flip back and talk about other types of beacons. So Apple released iBeacon a number of years ago, and it was cool and there was much rejoicing, uh, and they haven't really done anything on it since. Google, on the other hand, have decided these beacon things are very, very cool, and they want some of the action. So they've come up with this uh, thing called Eddystone, named after the Eddystone Lighthouse. Um, going back to the Lighthouse Beacon analogy from earlier. So rather than iBeacon, which is closed, it's a made-for-iPhone-type um, standard. If you want to make an iBeacon, you've got to give Apple some money. Google has said, let's open source it. So they've come up with three different standards for beacons. Uh, much the same way as Apple came up with the iBeacon standard. Eddystone has three different standards of beacons, and these are all open. So you want to create an Eddystone beacon? Conform to their, their standard, and that's it. It's kind of free. You can do it yourself. So um, one of their standards is called Eddystone UID, Unique Identifier. And that's a bit like iBeacon in that I have a unique identifier that gets broadcast out. Uh, the second one is EID, Ephemeral ID. And this is actually quite a cool one. What they do with Ephemeral ID is exactly the same as UID, but it's a continuously rotating ID. So remember the point I made earlier with iBeacons? It's just an ID sent out. Anybody can write an app to respond to your beacons because it's an ID that you can read. EID gets around this. You can read the ID, but 20 minutes later, that ID has changed. If you ever use Google Authenticator, an RSA token, any of these continuously changing keys, it's the same kind of thing as that. Um, Samsonite are using EID for luggage. So you have a little beacon in your luggage that transmits a rotating signal so that you can track your luggage, but no one else can because that ID keeps changing. Uh, now, EID is very new. They announced it last week. Literally, the day I had to submit these slides was the day they announced your, uh, EID just to, just to make my life a little bit hard. Uh, now, Eddystone URL, this one's very cool. Um, Eddystone URL is my beacon transmits a compressed URL. 
They've got their own little uh, compression scheme to avoid using HTTPS. You just use one character. And that sends out a compressed URL that you can pick up. Uh, in fact, if anybody's got an Android device um, on them that's on the latest Chrome, um, you can uh, you better use that later to have a look at one of these beacons. If anybody has an iOS device with Chrome installed, now would be a good time to install the Today Chrome widget. So go onto your Today screen and add Chrome to that, and we can use that for a little demo in a few minutes. Um, now, all this stuff is open source. They want to try and make it available to everyone. And as part of this, they want to make the beacons agnostic to the vendors. So every beacon vendor um, provides extra data through their own custom services. So when I connect to this Estimote beacon, I can get more information about the beacon using the Estimote's SDKs. Uh, they can actually connect to a separate service on here and can extract information and can configure the beacon. But if I use the Estimote SDK, I can't use that with a RAD beacon. Google have said, screw that. Let's make it open. So they've got Eddystone TLM, a telemetry packet, and every single Eddystone beacon, as well as the UID, EID, URL, also transmits the TLM packet. And in that, you have telemetry data, such as remaining battery life if you have a battery-powered beacon. Temperature is the beacon in motion. So this gives you a standard way of learning about your beacons without worrying too much about vendor lock-in. Google have also recently, last week, published a configuration GAT service. So for those who don't know BLE, a GAT service is the thing that makes BLE work. It's what you connect to to interact with a Bluetooth low energy device, such as a Bluetooth beacon. And the idea of this is, if your beacon conforms to this GAT service, you don't care who the vendor is, you can configure it. So you have code that talks the Bluetooth, the um, Google GAT service, then you're not locked into a particular beacon vendor. You buy Estimote beacons, you configure them using the, the Google stuff, you then throw those beacons away and use gimbal beacons, your code should still work, you shouldn't have any issues. Um, so that's very cool. This is Google's way of saying, screw Apple's lockdown iBeacon. We want to open this up to the world. And this is very much under development. So as I said, EID has only been out for a week. They're continuously growing this, continuously improving this. iBeacon, for all its coolness, was announced a few years ago and hasn't changed since. So let's just talk about Eddystone UID. So with iBeacon, we had our 128-bit unique identifier, major, minor version. Eddystone. This uses a uh, 10-byte namespace, 6-byte instance to, to, make, uh, to do its ID. Um, but they're not like iBeacons. So iBeacons are designed to wake your app up, designed to give you distance measurement for interlocation. This is more part of Google's idea of attaching data to the real world. So as part of that, you have to use their proximity API and their nearby messaging API. This is Google Play services stuff. This is not OS-level stuff. And it's a little bit complicated to get it working. So what you have to do is create a project in the Google Developer Console, get an API key. Using that API key, you have to register your beacon with the proximity API um, so that it's locked down to you, which is great, because that way your beacon ID is yours, but that means you still have to register it up in the cloud. And then to interact with it, you, look, you uh, fire up the nearby messaging API. You say, listen for Bluetooth messages. And then when your beacon is detected, the ID is picked up, the messaging API interprets this ID, goes off to the cloud, makes sure the ID is registered to the project that's got the API key that you've got embedded in your app, and downloads a message of data. Now, this is cool because it allows you to put data up in the cloud, managed in a content management system by Google that you can attach to a beacon. The downside is you have to go to the cloud. So you have to have a working internet connection at least the first time you detect a beacon to download that packet of data. iBeacon doesn't care. It's just Bluetooth. You pick it up. You do whatever. With Eddystone using the Google APIs, you have to go to the cloud. And that is a big downside. If you don't have good connectivity, if people don't want to turn on mobile data, you have a problem. Upside is this message in the cloud allows you to administer the data. It has standard fields for things like a place ID. So if you want to have your place registered with Google, you've got the latitude, longitude, floor location, you've got your coffee shop registered up there, you can, what have you, you can very much tie this in. So it's great for sourcing data. If, you, if people are maintaining information about your coffee shop uh, against the Google Places API, you just put an ID inside your packet of data and you get that. So it's quite cool for that. 
but you have to have that internet connection. And unlike iBeacon, this will not wake your device up. So you, you can poll for these messages in the background. You can write code to say, listen for these beacons, go off the proximity API, get the data, and run that as a background intent, a background service. But the API will not pass the message to your background service unless your device is awake. It doesn't have to be unlocked. You can go to your lock screen, and you'll get the message. But it doesn't happen in the background. So it may be great for crowdsourcing data about our coffee shop, but if we want to walk into a coffee shop, have our app woken up, and automatically order it, we can't use Eddie Stone for that. We're kind of limited a bit to iBeacon. Uh, and then, as I said, EID, exactly the same as UID, works exactly the same way, except the ID is continuously rotating. So we're a little bit more secure. So that's Eddie Stone UID. It uh, has its upsides, has its downsides. Eddie Stone URL, however, this is the cool one. I, I love this. I think this is fantastic. So in my Bluetooth packet, I have 17 ASCII characters in which I can embed a URL. Uh, they give me a few shortcuts. So I use zero to represent HTTP colon slash slash to save me a number of characters, a one for HTTPS. Uh, you've got other characters for www.com. But essentially, I can put 17 ASCII characters of a URL in my beacon and broadcast that out. And that allows me to attach a URL to a physical object. Uh, now, on an Android device, this should, be on your, uh, this should appear on your lock screen. If you've got Chrome with location permissions, it should be on your lock screen. On an iOS device, you use the uh, Today widget for the Chrome app, and then you can see it on your lock screen. Uh, it's not quite built in to iOS the way it's getting built into Android, but you can still use it. So if, I've got one here. It's running right now. So if anyone's got an Android device, have a look on your lock screen. It should, it can be a bit flaky, but you should see that little circle on a diamond thing there. If you have iOS and you have the Chrome widget on your Today screen, uh, make sure you turn on Find Physical Web Devices, and you should see a link to my blog. Uh, again, quick prayer to the demo gods, and hopefully, anyone see it? Yes. There we go. So again, thinking about our coffee shop. Uh, yeah, yes, it's great. I could write an app that responds to beacons that orders my coffee. But how do I know about this app? How does the coffee shop engage me and get me to download their app? And Eddystone URL gives us, to some degree, that power. Maybe not so much on iOS. Should be good on Android. But hopefully, when I get my phone out, when I'm waiting for my coffee, I could see on the lock screen, get the app, get it, and go. So good one for driving mobile engagement. This is not something that they've got an SDK for. It's not something you'd really build into your apps. Uh, if you want to write an app to respond to it, they've got Java samples of how to do it on the Google um, GitHub. But it's not something there's a proper SDK for. But it's designed so that your device can pick this up and you can see it in front of you on a lock screen. Um, so that one's very cool. OK. So we talked about iBeacon, what it can do. We talked about Eddystone, what it can do. Of course, the big question is, which one do I use? I want to build a context-aware app that understands the environment based off these Bluetooth signals. Which one should I use? Really, it depends. Or to be more accurate, it honestly doesn't matter. So the only thing we really care about here with, with these Bluetooth beacons is, on iOS, do I want my device to be woken up so that my app can do something? If that is what you want, if you want that more passive interaction of I detect a beacon and my app wakes up, you have to use iBeacon on iOS. Other than that, it really doesn't matter. iBeacon is not supported in the Android SDKs out of the box. But vendor SDKs give you iOS type iBeacon functionality on Android. I use an Estimote beacon, I install the Android Estimo SDK, I can create a beacon manager, the same as, we, as I create a location manager. And what it will do on Android is it will run a background service that will poll every 20 odd seconds um, to say, is there any beacons around? And if it detects one, it wakes your app up. So I can use iBeacons on Android with a vendor SDK. Eddystone uses the physical web, the proximity APIs, nearby messaging APIs. They're on iOS, they're on Android. If you like these proximity APIs, the idea of these packets of data managed by Google, the SDKs run on iOS and Android. So we're totally cross-platform. So really, the only question is, do I want my app to be woken up? 
on iOS. If you do, it's iBeacon. You can do anything you like on Android. But if you really want to be cool, you can buy something like the brand new Estimote Location Beacons, and they do everything. In the same beacon, you can transmit iBeacon and Eddystone. So again, thinking about our seamless coffee shop experience, I put a load of beacons around my coffee shop that broadcast an iBeacon packet and an Estimote URL packet at the same time from the same beacon. I walk in first time, I see on my lock screen, they've got an app, I install the app. I walk in the next time, the iBeacon packet is detected, my coffee gets ordered for me. Life is sweet. So really, doesn't matter what you use, you can do cool stuff with both. So where to get a beacon is the next question. I'm sure you're all thinking, wow, these are awesome. I want to play with these. Um, so there's a few manufacturers, Gimbal, uh, Radius, uh, Estimote, Contact. They all make good beacons. Uh, they all have their own APIs. They have extensions to their beacons. So these Estimate ones have got temperature sensors in, proximity sensors. They've got motion sensors. You can change the ID on these whenever they're in motion so that if you, if, if you move it, it can then wake somebody's app up. I could put one of these on my bike, and if someone tries to steal my bike, it can wake my phone up to say someone's nicking your bike. Um, all that kind of stuff comes with it. The new Estimo, um, newer beacons have got uh, GIPO, GPIO, whatever it is, the little pins, so you can plug in external sensors onto them as well. So you could have something that's got a radar in it, so when you get close, it starts transmitting an ID for you. Loads of power you can do with the new beacons. Um, my personal recommendation is Estimote beacons, and a big reason for it is the SDK support. Uh, on Gimbal Radius, out the box, they have native SDKs, iOS and Android. Uh, there are bindings available done by third parties. Estimo, they got those guys at that Xamarin company to do the bindings for them. Um, so if you want full Estimo support, there's a Xamarin component for iOS and Android um, that does everything you need. Uh, also as well, if you like the idea of some Estimo beacons, I've got a few to give away. Come find me around later on, um, and I'll chuck some beacons your way if you're interested. And that, wrapped up pretty quickly, uh, is iBeacons and Eddystone. So any questions from anyone? Uh, yeah, the gentleman in the middle had your hand up first. Do we have a microphone? Uh, yeah, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Windows Phone 8 doesn't really support Bluetooth low energy in the same way. Uh, Windows 10 kind of does have the BLE support that it needs, but I have yet to see any SDKs from any vendors to make this work. I'm sure it would be easy enough to write that, but I just haven't seen it out there yet. Uh, you, sir? And that's just the first, no, that just gives you the first in the list. That's standard system.link. That just gives me the first one in the array. Um, the, the beacons don't really come in any kind of order. So you'd ha if you wanted to find the closest, you'd go to that beacons array, order it by accuracy, and then get the first one that you find. Um, but again, that may not be the closest. Brooklyn Museum used a lot of beacons around to identify exhibits, and they found the exhibit you're nearest to may not be the one that your app thinks you're nearest to, because it could, could have clear line of sight to an exhibit behind you, and the closest one may have three people in front. So it's the guess is the nearest. Can't overemphasize that enough. It's a guess. Uh, who else? Sorry. In the, uh, Um, yes, case studies have shown, sorry, for those who didn't hear the question is, how do they work with lots of other big, uh, Bluetooth things around, do you get much interference? Um, so case studies, Brooklyn Museum is a great example. They've put thousands of beacons all around their museum, and that seems to be working fine for them. Target have rolled it out to a number of stores, um, and it seems to be working great uh, for them. They've put hundreds of beacons in there to help guide people to the products that they need. It seems to work fine. So, uh, yeah, sorry, the one in the middle there. So, okay, how does the coffee shop know where you're sitting? Do you remember we, we had that distance measurement? So if I have multiple beacons, based off the distance of those multiple beacons, I can triangulate my location. So imagine this room is 10 meters by 10 meters. If I put a beacon in the middle of each wall, depending on um, where I am, I will receive a different um, power measurement from each beacon. So if I'm sort of standing here, the measurement to here might be three meters, four meters, nine meters, 
six, seven meters. So from that, I can then work out my location using a bit of funky maths. OK, so well, again, um, you'd have to synchronize that up to a cloud somewhere. So you'd need some kind of, um, so you'd need an app, probably hosted on Azure, you know, um, where when you walk in, it sends the signal up to that server to say, make the coffee. And then as you kind of move around, it can um, get your location from your phone. So again, send that up to the server. They can see where you are and bring in the coffee. So it, the beacons themselves won't send your location. You have to manage that. But by using the distance measurements, you can work that out. Um, yeah, time for one more question over there. I, OK, the question was about the limitation of 20 regions. So on iOS, when you monitor a region, you can only monitor up to 20 regions. I don't know why they have that limit. I guess it's to stop you going nuts. And, um, because the OS has got to detect all these beacons. So as you're walking around, it's got to pick up a Bluetooth signal. And from that, say, OK, this goes to this app, this goes to this app. And the more beacons you have, the more it's got to sort through. And the more, it, the more energy it's going to use up in the background to work out which app to, to wake up. So I imagine it's to do with that, but I'm not 100% sure on exactly the reason. Sorry? 20 per app. Yes. I'm sure if you had 100 apps installed, each using 20, the OS might be a bit, a bit worried, but 20 per app is their limit. OK. Um, sorry? I've never heard of any limitations on Eddie Stone. Um, I guess because it's not waking you up. Your app is kind of active, so you're in charge of the Bluetooth. Um, so I don't think there's the same kind of limitation. So yeah, let's leave it at that. We're out of time. If you've got any more questions, come find me. I'm going to be wandering around in a, green, in a, a bright red uh, E-Road t-shirt. Um, my contact details were up there. They've now disappeared. But tweet me. Uh, and if anyone's interested in a job in New Zealand, come find me. Cool. Thank you.